morning and welcome to our service this morning at St John's. A special welcome to our visitors this morning, to John's. This morning, welcome to you and also um, both John's, yes, and uh, to Herman also. It's lovely to see you again. Uh, our public worship will be conduct conducted by myself this evening and uh, this morning and this evening. And Richard Lever, Richard Vaughan will be taking our evening service for those of you who are uh, going to attend, come to attend tonight. Um, just uh, Denise and, and uh, James are away on holidays at the moment. Um, and uh, just commend to your prayers those who are in retirement complexes, uh, that, that you remember them, um, including John Mercer, uh, Neb Taylor, who is now a member of our church in a retirement complex, and also Val and, and uh, Florence, who are at home still, but uh, as older people, that you remember them. There are others. Um, also, if you're remembering your prayers, uh, continue to remember uh, Michael Nakala and uh, Jean Millard. Their conditions, as far as I know, remain largely unchanged. Um, and uh, uh, so please keep them in your prayers. We return to the evening Bible study this Thursday night on, on computer, on Zoom. Uh, and Saturday morning we return to the prayer meeting. And the 6th of April, of course, will also be a working bee around the church hall ground starting at 8.30 if you're able to attend. Next Sunday, both services will be conducted by myself. Uh, corporate prayer times in your homes in particular are encouraged in the prayer times of our church. Saturday morning um, and uh, second and fourth Sundays after the service at 11 o'clock uh, in the uh, church office. Challenge newspaper is available. Um, Distribute your own goods Friday. You're most welcome to take any remaining copies to share with others. Um, and uh, with that, we'll just take a moment to prepare our hearts to meet with our God in worship. Let's worship our God this morning with a call to worship from the 52nd Psalm and it's uh, appropriately on the theme of uh, renewal as we think of the resurrection today. The 8th verse and the 9th verse says this, I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the mercy of God forever and ever. I will praise you forever and ever because you have done it. And in the presence of your saints, I will wait on your name, for it is good. While we're in the presence of his saints, we are here to wait on his name and his word, as we are among him and he is amongst us. Let's now take a moment to, uh, to sing his praise, uh, and it's the uh, hymn, Jesus, stand among us in your risen power as our entry.
Oh Lord our God, the living God who gives life now and eternally. This day and the morning of this day is a moment of rejoicing and thanksgiving in the wake of the victory over death by our Saviour, your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And while the church has crucifixes with the representation of a crucified Christ, our crosses are empty if we have them at all. For we do not dwell upon the sufferings of Christ often or long, for we know that his death has been swallowed up in victory as ours will be one day. And for this we come to you today to worship you, full of hope and full of joy. Blessed are you, our Father, for bringing about this moment, this event which reveals and confirms that even after death is defeated, even though death is defeated, it is death in itself to die, and to die forever when the last of your loved beloved people are drawn into the kingdom and the resurrection from the dead takes place. We stand in awe of your power for many things, our Father, but to raise the dead is a matter of great astonishment to us. We sit in silent wonder at the thought of what you can do. You are our God, for whom clearly and obviously nothing is impossible. You are the creator of heaven and earth. You are the recreator of the dead to life. And how glorious are the wisdom and the power evident in these things, but especially in the resurrection of our Saviour. And how blessed are your people to be able to share in that hope of the resurrection for themselves personally. O oh Lord, we confess there is none like you. There is none who can stay your hand from whatever you will to do. You are great beyond telling, and your mighty deeds speak to confirm this of you to us. So hear us as we respond to you in your word today. Bless us, O oh God, with open ears and open hearts as we meditate upon your holy word concerning these glorious things. For we ask it all to the praise of your glory. In our Lord Jesus' name. We're going to sing to God's praise now. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hearts to heavens and voices rise.
Let's turn in the Word of God now to the book of 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 17 and 17 to 24 is the reading. First Kings chapter 17 and verse 17. In this account of the resurrection of the, the son of the, uh, the uh, widow of Zarephath um, is, uh, follows on the feeding, the miraculous feeding of Elijah during the great famine that took place in the northern kingdom. So after they survived the famine through the jar of oil and the flour that never ran out. Um, this is what happened uh, subsequent to that event. Now it happened after these things that the son of a woman who owned the house became sick and his sickness was so serious that there was no breath left in him. So she said to Elijah, what have I to do with you, O, son, o man of God? Have you come to me to bring my son, my sin to remembrance? to kill my son. So he said to her, give me your son. He took, her, he, he took him out of her arms. He carried him up to the upper room where he was staying and he laid him on his own bed. Then he cried out to the Lord and said, O Lord my God, have you also brought tragedy upon the widow with whom I lodge by killing her son? And he stretched himself out on the child three times and cried out to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, my God, I pray, let this child's soul come back to him. Then the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came back to him, and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper room into the house and gave him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son lives. And then the woman said to Elijah, now by this I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord is in your mouth, and it is the truth. Amen. We shall be looking later today at the impact of the resurrection, which in that case, of course, led to uh, faith in God and the worship of God. So we're going to take a moment now to confess our sins to him, as we are in his presence. We should do that in the name of Jesus, to have our sins cleared. Let's pray. Our great God and glorious Saviour, we know as your people that the God of so many today is too small, that the gods of modern man, which are the fiction of their own imagination, have arms that are too short to save, minds that are too small and weak to be able to even consider the impossible, much less to do it. When religious men say that the dead cannot be raised, that miracles are not the exercise of divine power, but the exercise of ignorant stupid, of, of superstitious minds, they reveal that their gods are idols who are not more wise, more powerful than they themselves are or think they can be. We confess we live in an age when people think that you are altogether like them, as the psalmist said. What a folly it is when humans don't know you or cannot believe you or both. And so today, our God, as we look around us and we see so much faithlessness in our secularising communities, save us from the fear that comes from ignorance. You, our God, are not too small. Teach us to trust you for every need to deal with every fear, to cope with every anxiety. Remind us that nothing is too hard for you and nothing is impossible. You can raise sons of Abraham from stones. You can put flesh on a valley full of dry bones. You can speak to the dead and make them live. So save us, Lord, from any petty fears or worries born of such idolatrous thoughts as are common today that you cannot do these things. Fill us instead with your spirit. Help us to embrace all of your promises, to rest in your power and your omnipotence every day and in every way, especially when pressures and troubles come upon us. 
teach us confidence in the future because of the awe-inspiring works of the past and the promise of great things in the future. For we ask this with the forgiveness of all our many other sins. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. We're going to sing again to God's praise. Yours is the glory. turn again in the Word of God to the letter of the Apostle Paul to the Corinthians, the first letter, chapter 15. Then we're going to read verses 1 to 11. This chapter, of course, is famous for the general subject of the resurrection in it, particularly the last eight verses, but we're going to be dealing with the first 11 this morning. So it's 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 to 11. Let's hear together the word of the living God. Moreover, brothers, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received, and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast to that word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, 
that he was buried and that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures and that he was seen by Kephas then by the twelve and after that he was seen by over five hundred brethren at once of whom the greater part remain to the present but some have fallen asleep now after that he was seen by James then by all the apostles then last of all he was seen by me also as one born out of due time for I am the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God but by the grace of God I am what I am and his grace toward me was not in vain but I laboured more abundantly than they all yet not I but the grace of God which was in me therefore whether it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. Amen. And again, to God be all the glory for his word this morning. We're going to uh, take a moment to give thanks to God for the offerings and to pray for the blessing of those offerings this morning. Let's pray. O oh Lord our God, Thank you for new life, which has come to us through the Lord Jesus Christ. For the exercise of power in the mind and heart, whereby now we can embrace and confidently the testimony of your people to the resurrection of Jesus. What a remarkable thing uh, is God-given faith, that while others cannot and will not trust in the vast majority of our fellow citizens, we can do so quietly and confidently. While others live dying, we can die living and in the face uh, and face the day of our death as our best day and not our worst. Bless the mission of the gospel, we pray, today in all places, beginning here in our local area and beyond. Use the tithes and offerings that have been given through the week and put in the, the offering boxes this morning to bring the message of new life in Christ to more. For this is our heart's desire for those who are as yet without the hope of eternal life. We ask it in the name of Jesus who has brought it to us through his death, resurrection and ascension. ascension. Amen. So we shall sing again to God's praise. Christ the Lord is risen today. Hallelujah.
Let's take a moment now to pray for others, remembering especially the Easter season, and those who minister in the Easter season in various ways. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we thank you for the opportunity that is afforded to the whole nation today and over this weekend to be able to rest, but especially to be able to rest and be ministered to and to minister to others in the church and congregational camps and youth camps that are going on over this period. We know there are people who have been wonderfully reconciled to God as a result of these simple ministries. Not only by the message that has been heard and been delivered, but also by the love and the genuine concern of leaders uh, and staff alike. We do pray that this would be the case with these, with these ministries on this Easter in 2024, that you would be pleased to grant to many life through the message of Easter, the gospel as it affects their lives to bring them peace with God, and also through the love of those who serve them. We remember again those who will be ministering in a different way on the Easter roads and in the hospitals and other places of care in the nursing homes. As they look after those who have been injured or hampered in some way by ill health or old age, who do not have the freedom and the life and the joy that many have who are healthy still. We pray for special grace for those who are emergency services, for our police officers, for our ambulance and fire officers who must attend some of the accidents that will occur. We thank you too especially for the State Emergency Services officers. We remember Dan Armstrong, son Corey Armstrong in Tasmania, Mary Brigden in Central and Northern New South Wales. We thank you for their commitment, their skill, their abilities, uh, for their success over many years. We do pray that they would continue to be effective as, as they are able in these present circumstances. And that you'd be pleased, Lord, to, um, to keep them safe with their colleagues in the pursuit of their duties in these traumatic instances. We pray for comfort for those who are sick and shut in, for the comfort of family and brothers and sisters in Christ who may visit them over, the, over, the, over this period of days. And you'd be pleased to encourage those who are your children through the recorded services that they receive and other ministry. We thank you, our God, for the word of God which we shall be hearing concerning the resurrection and we pray as always for the Holy Spirit to own the word that is uttered uh, and that he might apply powerfully and mixed with faith in the hearts of those who hear it. We ask this for all of us and for the sake of your glory in our Lord Jesus' name. Amen. Recently I was watching some YouTube videos involving discussions about the resurrection and its place in history. Uh, the author Lee Strobel has a couple of books, The Case for Christ and The Case for the Resurrection, which were part of the discussions, but others were mentioned as well. Among the most powerful evidences for the facts of the re resurrection come from a combination of truths that relate to the Jewish nation's survival. So what does the survival of the Jewish nation have to do with confirming the resurrection accounts as factual? You may not see a connection, but there is. The late R.C. Sproul, Dr. R.C. Sproul, once answered, once answered the question as to how he was sure that there was a God and that it was the God of the Bible. And he replied, the Jewish nation. I've never heard anyone answer the question that way. That they are such a small population, that they survived 3,500 years through the rise and fall of super nations, that they've survived two violent purges, numerous scatterings, and cling to their God, their religious book, and their identity, is only possible throughout those three and a half thousand years because of supernatural help and influence. I want you to hold that thought for a little while. Where did the New Testament church come from? Well, it came out of a Jewish people. It was initially an exclusively Jewish movement. 
It was all Jews founded by a Jewish rabbi with Jewish disciples. But the question is, how is that possible? If this Jewish Old Testament religion was so powerful and still is today for those who cling to it, and so precious and so deeply ingrained in the minds and the hearts of the psyche of this little ethnic group, to the point where nothing could tear them apart from God and, and their faith for, for 1,500 years before that moment, and for 2,000 years since for those who remain in the Jewish religion, what happened? What could have occurred that was so powerful that holocausts, exiles, and invasions and oppressions, oppressions could not separate this people from the Jewish, and they could not separate the people from the Jewish religion suddenly and rapidly caused a schism in the Jewish people in the early first century. What was it? And the answer to that question is what some scholars believe to be the overwhelming confirmation that the resurrection happened along with the events that now make up the New Testament. That is the subject of the sermon this morning on the Resurrection Sunday under the title of The Impact of the Resurrection. The first of the impacts of the resurrection is retroactive. It confirms the death of Christ as effective for atoning for sins. And then we shall look at some others after that. So let's begin with the resurrection um, and how it relates to the cross. The resurrection, as I mentioned earlier, is a vindication of the efficacy of the atonement. A vindication of the effectiveness or the efficacy of the atonement. That's what the resurrection is. In 1 Corinthians 15, 1 following, the Apostle Paul addresses the hard, cold facts of the resurrection event. And it was a core subject, one of two, that formed the, uh, the main topics of the early preaching of the Apostles. The early sermons of the Apostles were not at first sight uh, and sound expositions or explanations of the passages of the Old Testament. The early sermons were simply public announcements of two momentous things that occurred around the year 30 AD. Or in terms of the Roman calendar, the 200, 202nd year of the Olympiad, as confirmed by that famous debate over the cause of the three hours of darkness while Jesus was on the cross between 12 and 3 p.m. And this debate was, of course, involving the first century historian named Thallus. Paul sets out these two core subjects, the resurrection and the cross, to the Corinthian church in the early 50s AD of the first century as follows, verses 3 and 4. Paul said, For I deliver to you, first of all, that is of first priority, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that's number one, and two, that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So in other words, a little more than 20 years after those events, the crucifixion and the resurrection, Paul sets out the two key issues of his public proclamations to the Christians at Corinth as the death of Christ for their sins and the resurrection of Christ as the vindication of his sacrificial death for those sins. Now this is important in terms of the historical fact of these things and their impact. Not even one generation has gone past and these two events are being declared as facts crucial to the eternal prospects of individual Christians and the present needs of the church. Later, Paul will refer to the fact that many of the people who witnessed these events were in fact still alive 20 years after the events. In fact, the vast majority, from his words in verse 6 of chapter 15, as to Jesus' death, did you know that there were five non-Christian historians who wrote about Jesus, who were born in that first century, and there were another three, aside from those five, non-Christian historians who wrote about these events in the second century. Between them, these pagan Roman historians confirmed at least 14 of the facts that are recorded in the New Testament concerning the life and especially the death of Jesus of Nazareth and by implication the resurrection. I'll come to that. Of particular interest 
were the repeated references to those who killed Jesus and how. And they all mention it, these pagan writers. Pilate was responsible and his method of execution was crucifixion. This is interesting because there were thousands of public crucifixions in around the time of the life of Jesus. And hundreds, if not thousands, of those crucifixions were Jews, mostly for rebellion. And they weren't Christian Jews either. They were just Jewish citizens. So out of all of that tumult, out of all of those deaths by crucifixion, the death of Jesus of Nazareth stands out boldly enough to be recorded by five famous non-Christian historians and another three in the early next century. I want you to ponder that thought for a moment. If you are depending on Christ's death to save you from the consequences of your sins against God and man, and I hope you are, then you can be certain of that death. Not just because God, God's word says so, not just because the New Testament rec records the death of Jesus, or because the Old Testament predicts it so remarkably in the 52nd and 53rd chapters of Isaiah, but because the annals of history, non-Christian history, confirm that Jesus died and from that we can infer, consistent with the, 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 uh, the testimony of the Old and the New Testament, that in his death he shed his blood, making forgiveness for anyone at any time who looks to him available and indeed secure. So the resurrection helps to confirm that, which is conferred, confirmed by non-Christian historians. That's the impact uh, of the crucifixion in history and the resurrection, as I said, is confirmative of all that. The resurrection depends upon the historic death of Jesus of Nazareth, of course, Jesus the Christ. The death, of Christ. the death of Christ was truly redemptive and truly effective, but it finds its confirmation or proof, if you like, in the resurrection to follow. But before I, before I want to... Before I do that, I want to remind you of what the Apostle here says about both the events and their place in the Scriptures. The impact of the resurrection not only confirms the redemptive power of the cross, but it fulfills some key ancient prophecies. And, upon, and on this resurrection day, we should briefly see how. This is what the Apostle Paul said in verses 3 and 4 of 1 Corinthians 15. The two issues that were the core of his announcements to the world. Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. He rose again on the third day, according to the scriptures. And the scriptures there are the Old Testament, because the New Testament didn't exist. Or it was coming into being. The crucifixion and the resurrection were then events that were both according to the scriptures. Which scriptures? Um, they are the scriptures of the Old Testament. And the scriptures are and contain predictions foretelling the crucifixion, as they contain uh, predictions regarding the resurrection. Which scriptures contain the foretelling of the crucifixion? Well, in Isaiah 53, 4 and 5, and 7 to 9, the scriptures foretold of the Messiah being treated this way. This is the prophet Isaiah, 750 years before Christ came. That he would be stricken, that he would be struck, that he would be wounded, that he would be bruised, that he would be chastised, that he would be afflicted. But it doesn't end there because Isaiah saw more about what would happen to the suffering servant. Specifically, he was to be killed according to four prophecies in Isaiah 53, 8 to 10, and 12. And that he was going to be killed to atone for sins. And that's recorded specifically in verses 7, 8, 10, and 12. All of this in Isaiah 53. All of that is a very accurate description of the horrific physical abuse that the Lord eventually endured, and of course his physical death. As to the means of death by piercing of the flesh and bloodshed, this is predicted in several places, such as Psalm 22, verse 16, and Zechariah 12, 10. This is confirmed 
as prophetic in John 19.37 and Revelation 1.7, that he was the pierced one, according to the prophets, in the Psalms and in Zechariah, the afflicted one, according to the prophet Isaiah, this one whom the John the baptizer called the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Well, we all here know and embrace the predictions of his death from the Old Testament, as we have read them, and we read them on Friday morning. But what about his resurrection? Is his resurrection also predicted? Before I go to the Old Testament, let me remind you that Jesus himself predicted his own resurrection repeatedly to his disciples at least three times in Matthew's Gospel, specifically 1621, 1723 and 2632. However, the question here is, did the Old Testament scriptures predict the Messiah's resurrection? The answer, of course, is yes. Two well-known instances of this come to mind. The first is Isaiah 53, 10-12, in these words which describe his life after he makes his soul, through his death, an offering for sin. This is what is said. Isaiah said, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord, or the good pleasure of the Lord, shall prosper in his hand after he dies. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify the many, for he shall bear their iniquities as he is dying. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil among the strong after he dies. These verses speak of a future beyond his sacrificial death. For those of you who are curious, the word seed there commonly refers to children or physical descendants. But the word can also be used of spiritual descendants, and in one instance it's used of family members or kinsmen in the, in the Hebrew language. It is also speaking of him prolonging his days, which include not merely the six weeks he spent among his people before the ascension, but beyond it, of course, into heaven. It speaks of him being satisfied after his death with his accomplishments. It also refers to him sharing the victory spoils of the future, a thing he began to do immediately on earth and in heaven. But ultimately it refers particularly to the Ascension Day, uh, which is described in Revelation 5, 1 to 11, and of course prophetically in Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 to 13, and the Day of Judgment. The ancient Old Testament scriptures spoke of his resurrection in detail and its implications for Christ and his people. It has an enormous impact upon the man Jesus of Nazareth, who was and is the King of kings and Lord of lords and worthy to be worshipped with God the Father. However, it also had an enormous impact upon the disciples. And here is where we come back to the claim of Dr. R.C. Sproul that the survival of the Jews is indirectly as a proof of God's existence. That the Christian short church born out of that people whose adherence to the God of the Old Testament was and is so powerful that even the horrors of persecution and death could not make them abandon their faith, could not make them abandon their faith until the first Easter. So let's consider that now in terms of the resurrection as a verifiable fact because of its impact upon the Jewish nation and the Jews whom John later calls the first fruits of the gospel of God's saved people. So, we're talking about now, we're starting to look at the facts, the verifiable facts of history that the resurrection um, creates. So the question is, what happened in that first century that convinced thousands initially and then tens of thousands of Jewish people to abandon an Old Testament religion and much of its culture in spite of the powerful hold that it had on the Jewish people through three and a half thousand years. A growing number of scholars agree. What caused this severance, this schism in the Jewish nation was the resurrection. That's what caused this extraordinary cleavage of the Jewish people in a way that persecution and death and exile and all the other horrors that, were, uh, that they suffered could not make them abandon their Old Testament heritage. Here is the passage um, that Paul cites, that they would cite as Exhibit A. Paul says, He, the risen Christ, was seen by Peter, then by the Twelve, 
After that he was seen by over 500 brothers at once, of whom the greater part remain alive to the present, but some have fallen asleep. And after that he was seen by James and then by all the apostles, and then last of all he was seen by me also, as one born out of time. So the most immediate impact of the resurrection upon these strongly, solemnly unified Jewish people was on the 12, beginning with Peter. However, this little passage of four verses provides us with the unassailable confirmation of the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth and with it, the solid historical confirmation of our confidence, not only in the gospel records, but in the whole of the scriptures. Some of you may know of the battle that has raged over this issue. Because as someone has rightly said, if you disprove or credit, discredit the resurrection, the physical resurrection of Jesus, Christianity is not destroyed in the cradle, it's destroyed in the womb. Or should I say, it's destroyed in the tomb. I have preached in the past on some of the attempts to discredit the resurrection on the basis of available historical evidence, what people would now call debunking the resurrection. So let's look at some of the most popular debunking theories used to explain away the resurrection. Briefly, and I'll just list the top three, they are as follows. There is the swoon theory, so called because its proponents say that the resurrection never happened because Jesus never died on the cross. He simply fainted and everyone thought he was dead and he revived in the tomb and later recovered and went, out, went on to live out his life. The problems with this theory are so great as to render anyone pushing the th this theory as a laughing stock. And I won't go into those, but you should be able to see immediately some of those concerns, like a wounded man fighting off Roman soldiers and so on, and pushing a one and a half ton stone away from the door of the tomb. So the swoon theory is sheer nonsense, but it's been pushed by some very prominent people. Then there's the wrong tomb theory, namely that the women and the disciples in their terrible grief went to the wrong tomb. Well, of course, the answer to that is, well, if they did that, then Jew the Jewish leaders would simply have gone to the right tomb and produced the corpse, and that would have been the end of Christianity. Then, of course, there's one of the most ridiculous of the theories, and yet a popular one amongst so-called intellectuals, the hallucination theory, that people were in such grief and could not accept that Jesus had died, and so they wanted to see him, and they hallucinated. One of the modern analysts of, the, of this whole issue asked his local psychologist about 500 people having the same hallucination at once. And the psychologist rightly replied that hallucinations are a total, are the result of a totally individual psychology. The prospect of 500 people having the same hallucination means that they would all have the same psychology. And the psychologist said that would have been a bigger miracle than the resurrection itself. Now I said there are other theories that are less famous and even less credible than the above ludicrous attempts to explain away an event that has involved multiple sightings, multiple places, at multiple times by multiple people, in fact up to 500 in one case. And as uh, I think Albert Barnes says in our notes, just leaving my notes for a moment, if 500 isn't enough, then nothing will be. Two historians, both Roman, record the impact of something happening that points to the resurrection. Flavius Josephus, a Jewish Roman, in his work Antiquity of the Jews, recorded this of the events of the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. And I quote Flavius Josephus, writing around the end of the first century, early second. He said, Pilate condemned Jesus to be crucified and to die. But those who had become his disciples did not abandon his discipleship. They reported that he had appeared to them three days later after his cru crucifixion and that he was in fact alive. Josephus was not saying himself that Jesus rose. He was saying that his disciples reported that they preached, pronounced that he had risen. Josephus also mentions James, a brother of Jesus, who was called the Christ. 
and I hadn't realized this, but Josephus also mentions John the Baptist and his brutal death at the hands of Herod. Again, details confirming specifically the New Testament record as historical. The other historian was one of the most respected Roman historians of the period. His name is Cornelius Tacitus. He wrote in the year 64 AD during the reign of Nero, around the time that Paul uh, lost his life, probably due to Nero and his violent reign. And Tacitus recorded the following in his work Annals, which is uh, uh, a word for the Annals of History. He said, Christus, or Christ, from whom they get their name, the Christians, uh, was executed at the hands of Pontius Pilate during the reign of Emperor Tiberius. Now, checked for the moment, this pernicious superstition, Christianity, again broke out, and not only in Judah, Judea, the source of the evil, but even in Rome. Tacitus is recording the impact of the resurrection when he wrote, checked for a moment the death of Jesus, it broke out again, the preaching of the disciples six weeks later after the ascension. Yes, it was checked by the crucifixion. And for the six weeks during the time that Jesus was appearing as disciples, until, according to Tacitus, it broke out again, and it broke out again on the day of Pentecost and began to sweep the ancient world, starting with the 3,000 saved on the day of Pentecost, which later became 5,000 not long after, and rapidly spreading through the ancient world, driven by violent persecution. That gap to which Tacitus referred, followed by the outbreak, is precisely the impact of the resurrection, an impact that is still going on in the spread of the gospel. Why? It was because of the resurrection. The church itself today is historical proof of the resurrection. Because without the church, without the resurrection, the church would not be here. The disciples would have gone the way of all the disciples of the other 30 self-acclaimed messiahs who were killed in that period and whose disciples died or were scattered as a result forever. So the resurrection is a verifiable fact of human history, as you've just heard. It is, it is, um, it is resisted the greatest attempts of the church's harshest and cleverest enemies to try and deny and debunk it. But God has ensured that the declaration of the resurrection, which was supported so strongly, as you've heard, by the hard evidence from outside of the church, that 2,000 years on, men are still, uh, men, uh, in spite of this, men are still stumbling at its authenticity and its factual basis. Among the modern authors who have successfully tackled this question, starting in the 19th century, to prove or to establish the historicity and the faithfulness of the resurrection accounts are men like Dr. Simon Greenleaf, an American um, attorney uh, who wrote an important work on it. In the 20th century, there was a journalist named Frank Morrison who wrote a book called Who Moved the Stone? Then there was the author, American author Josh McDowell, two volumes, Evidence That Demands a Verdict. And most recently, Lee Strobel, The Case for Christ and The Case for the Resurrection. Your faith in Christ as your Redeemer and Saviour from sin does not rest upon the word of one or two people in ancient times who were obscure, who saw something that no one else saw in some corner of ancient, obscure Palestine, but it rests upon the witness of hundreds of people concerning the re resurrection and tens of thousands of people concerning the extraordinary public ministry of Jesus of Nazareth between the years 26 and 30 AD. The testimony of these 514 people mentioned in 1 Corinthians 15, 5-7 is the most critical impact of the resurrection in terms of the gospel message. The fact of the resurrection of the man Jesus, called the Christ, is one half of the public announcement that constituted the simple message of the early church. These men went and simply declared, Jesus is risen. It wasn't as stark as Jonah's terrible and hopeless threat to the Ninevites that in 40 days from now God's going to destroy your city. The apostles' message was much more hopeful. It was that Jesus was risen. 
Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. The impact of the resurrection was not only to revive the mission of Jesus, but ultimately to empower it through the day of Pentecost. So Tacitus was right. The movement broke out again. And the only explanation that fits all the facts is that Jesus of Nazareth rose from the dead, unlike every other failed Messiah before him and after him. That our Saviour conquered death in this way, that he left such a great cloud of witness or crowd of witnesses, is part of what makes the credibility of the Gospels and the rest of the New Testament so unassailable by the critics. It is also what makes the Gospel so irresistible to those who embrace it, even if they haven't seen the historical evidence. The transformation in the whole attitude of the disciples, which Josephus noted, is also the experience of every person who reads the accounts of the resurrection and is, is convinced by the enabling of the Holy Spirit. However, it is not merely a matter of reviving the morale that Christ's res resurrection produced in the disciples. It was a confirmation to them of the identity of Christ as the Son of God, as the Saviour of the world, and eventually as the King of kings and Lord of lords. And for that reason, this event has rightly been called the hinge of history. It marks the turning point in human fortunes. It set in motion the great restoration of all things to which Jesus referred, a restoration which goes on to this day. After the resurrection comes the day of Pentecost, when not only is the, the morale and the mission restored from the, from, from the words of Matthew 28, uh, 19 and 20 and Acts 1 8, the risen Christ becomes the ascended Christ, and the ascended Christ becomes the reigning Christ. And that is another enormous impact of the resurrection. From this flows the grace and power of God, not just to the church as an institution, but to each individual member. It means for each one of us here today who has this conviction based on the word of God, with or without the historical evidence, which God has left us in his word, um, they have the newness of life through the Holy Spirit that bring grace and power for living, serving, worshipping and yes, witnessing. We have been raised to newness of life through the Holy Spirit. The 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians contains many personal impacts upon us which include the irrepressible hope in the face of severe trial and losses and a purpose to all our labours, to all our labour, because they are not in vain uh, through death itself. The personal impact of the resurrection leaves those who accept its claims without seeing it, as Jesus said to Thomas, as even more blessed than those who saw it itself. Jesus himself said, because I live, you will live also. And therefore, it impacts us in the way we look at life and it should change the way we look at death forever. To conclude, it is, the, it is a testimony to God's existence that a small ethnic group like the Jews could survive three and a half thousand years. Such was the tenacity with which they clung to their God and their, and their Old Testament, in spite of the horrors of so much of its history. Even unbelieving Jews through the Old Testament are blessed in many ways by the wisdom of the Old Testament which it possesses. But the existence of the church is an even more remarkable evidence of God's hand because something transformed the lives of those zealous and committed first century Jews from being willing to live and die for their God and their religion and their cultural heritage to abandoning it for a supposedly dead Messiah. And the scholars are right. That momentous change in those early Jews can only be explained by something so extraordinary as to force them to leave the comfort and safety of life in the Hebrew religion and to embrace the harsh realities of faith and life in Jesus. It is not the crucified Christ that inspired this, but the risen Christ is what's, what some are now saying, and I think rightly so. It was not his suffering and dying, but his rising and living the challenge those Jews to make the unthinkable change, knowing the losses that would be experienced with it departing from their heritage. The power of the risen Christ transformed the early church from a defeated, terrified and depressed organisation to one which was victorious, irrepressible 
and all conquering. It is this same power, I remind you this morning, that is at work in every one of his people today, transforming him or her into the image of God in Christ. So I ask you today, has the resurrection impacted your life in this way? I can only hope so. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, for the wonder of the events of Easter, we give you thanks this morning. But we also thank you today for eyes to see and ears to hear. And for grace to believe without seeing. For the grace to believe even without the evidence coming from other historical sources which now make arguments against you the resurrection and its reality impossible. We thank you for the confirmation of all these things and for the boldness that it gives us to live our lives, to face our life with all its difficulties, including our death, with great confidence and increasing confidence. We rejoice in these blessed impacts upon our lives and we do pray that as we live those lives, you would help us to encourage others to know what we know to trust what we trust in terms of our Saviour, his death, resurrection and ascension. We ask this in his name and for your glory. Amen. We are going to sing uh, a rousing hymn of the proclamation of the resurrection. This is our glad announcement. service by singing together the benediction by the grace of Christ our Son.